So I woke up yesterday morning from a really strange dream. Bill Jeffries, Teresa Dunn, two pastors in our church, and I were leading an ecumenical worship service, a huge gathering of Christians in a large modern auditorium. I have no idea what was Bill and Teresa and not Brandon and, and Rhonda, but that's just how it played out. And, and just before I was supposed to stand in the program to lift up one or more persons in a special prayer, I don't know why, but that was this part in the, in the order, some group among the worshipers, they were not United Methodists, were making a presentation and they were sharing something of interest, like a mission opportunity with everybody there. And we all listened patiently. Well, at least we did it first because they went on and on and on. And by the time they finished, I had forgotten whom I was supposed to pray for. And it was really awkward because I had this awkward pause and I was just standing there waiting for the thought to come to my mind and everybody was waiting for me to start speaking and, and I couldn't call it up. I couldn't call up the name. And then people started drifting away out of, this, out of the worship space, including Teresa Dunn. I wish she were here so I could tease her. I hope she's gonna watch this service. But I bolted out of the sanctuary and I ran to Teresa and I asked her desperately whom I'm supposed to pray for. And she, and if you know Teresa, she rolled her eyes at me and sort of get, oh, Randy, you know, and she told me who it was. And then I raced back into the auditorium, but before I could speak, Bill Jeffries must have figured that too much time was passing with dead silence. So he started, he had started talking and he was kind of ad-libbing, but I didn't want us to get any further off track. So I just jumped right in and announced whom we were gonna pray for and I cut off Bill. So I'm sorry about that, Bill. Here's the best part though of my dream. I didn't just lead with a spoken prayer. I started getting into a rhythm with my prayer that soon started turning into singing. Yes, me, I was singing. And, and I, this, I've never dreamed about singing before as far as I can recall. And, and this was not just quiet singing. Soon I was belting out the prayer like a singer on one of those talent shows on TV and music was playing and I was feeling so caught up in the moment and close to God and everyone was shouting in a good way, not at me by the way, in a good way, shouting together and singing along and I felt their love and we were all praising God joyfully together. And that's when I woke up. Now, if you've ever been close to me in worship, or if the microphone that I wear has not been turned off by the tech crew during a song, you know how just weird this, how absurd this dream is. I can't sing, I really, and when I say that, you know, a lot of people go, oh yeah, right, you can't sing. No, seriously, people have told me that over my lifetime. When, when the microphone has accidentally been left on, they will remind me, politely, maybe not so much, just how poorly I sing. And it was amazing. I mean, aside from the fact of the odd particulars of this dream, the fact that I was praying and praising like I was a contestant on America's Got Talent has to be the weirdest thing one could imagine. Some things are hard to make sense of, aren't they? Today's scripture from the 16th chapter of Luke is an example of something difficult to understand. Jesus tells a parable, a story, to reveal the truth about the kingdom of God. And as recorded by Luke in this parable, the manager working for a wealthy man squanders his property. And so the rich man calls this steward into his office and confronts him with this charge, demanding a full accounting for his mismanagement and telling him that he's fired. So as we heard, the manager must be guilty because he doesn't deny the charges or he doesn't try to explain away his actions. Instead, after worrying about what he's gonna do when he's unemployed, given that he apparently didn't have any other useful skills, he comes up with a plan, a scheme, really, in which he secretly meets with each of those persons who are indebted, or at least with several of them, who are indebted to the master and he reduces their obligations, not with the master's permission, secretly, with the clear aim of getting on their good side so they might help him out and give him a place to land when he's out on the streets. So he compounds his wastefulness of the rich man's property by giving more of it away. Outrageous. Well, the boss finds out about it and you'd have to think he'd be as mad as a hornet given how this servant has swindled him for personal gain. But that's not how the rich man responds. No, as we heard, Jesus says he commends the manager because he acts shrewdly. He 
doesn't chastise him. He doesn't yell at him. He doesn't even glare at him as far as we can tell. No, he, the owner pats him on the back and because he is quick on his feet. He celebrates his selfish, conniving cleverness, even though at his expense. Now, this story is considered by most commentators the most challenging of all the parables told by Jesus because it seems so out of line from what we would expect him to say. I mean, how do you square it with all of his other teachings? What could he possibly have meant by it? The manager was a con artist, a selfish swindler. How could that man be held up as an example of virtue? There's a commentator who wrote back, I think in the 50s, McLean Gilmore, and he wrote this. There is nothing edifying about this parable. The steward's conduct was characterized in the beginning by incompetence and in the end by flagrant dishonesty. And yet Luke records it in his gospel as a teaching of Jesus. And so therefore, I'd say we have to wrestle with it, even if it's got us in a headlock. Now, some have tried to come up with explanations to water down the shock value of the story. They've suggested, for example, that, you know, maybe the owner was charging usurious interest rates to his customers, which the steward was giving back when he cut their bills. Or maybe, maybe these were all bad debts. And so, you know, the owner was just glad to get anything for them. Or maybe the steward was only cutting his own commission out of the debts. So it was his money lost, not the owner's. But here's the problem with that. There's nothing in the parable that suggests any of those things. So I think we have to take the story at face value and try to figure out why the owner applauded the crooked steward for his bad behavior and why Jesus said the other things that Luke reports him to have said. What's the takeaway here? Assuming it's not to grab all you can, however you can. You know, the challenges of preaching this parable remind me of a story about a mother who one Sunday morning went to wake up her son and, and tell him that it was time to get ready for church. To which he replied, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you two good reasons. One, they don't like me. And two, I don't like them. His mother replied, well, I'll give you two good reasons why you should go to church. One, you're 59 years old. <laughs> and two, you're the pastor. <laughs> this is one of those mornings when I might have wanted to remain in bed rather than face this scripture. But I'm the pastor, so here goes. In his 1924 work, The Exemplar of the Rabbis, Moses Gaster tells of a folk tale that may open the window to clear meaning in this challenging parable. The story goes in that folk tale. The thief is caught and he's sentenced to hang for his crime. And as he's being carried to the place of execution, he says he knows a secret that the king should be aware of and that he should like, he'd like to share with the king before he's put to death. And so he says that he will bury a pomegranate seed in the ground and by a secret means taught him by his father, the seed will amazingly grow and bear fruit overnight. Everyone in the kingdom, including the king, wants to witness this miracle. And so the man's execution is postponed so he can demonstrate this secret that he had shared. And with all the citizens assembled of the kingdom and the king watching, the man digs a hole. But then he stops. And he says the seed can only be placed into the hole by someone who has never in his life stolen a thing or kept something that wasn't his. Well, all of those present, including the kingdom officials and even the king himself, realize that at various times in their past, they've been guilty of some indiscretion that disqualifies them from planting the pomegranate seed. The thief then says to them, you have power and want nothing. You cannot plant this seed any more than I can, yet I'm to be hanged while you are to live. The king is so moved by the thief's argument that he pardons and releases him. Now maybe you and I need, maybe what you and I need in order to understand better the parable from Luke is a change in perspective. We listen as did the disciples while Jesus tells this parable about and describes the unsavory character of this sly manager. And we see him for what he is, a scoundrel, a sinner in other words. The man is out for himself and he'll bend the rules and do whatever is necessary to get out of the jam in which he finds himself. He squanders what's been given to him and then he lies and cheats when he gets caught. 
We cluck our tongues and roll our eyes at this miserable man, which is why it's so hard to hear his employer praise him for his cleverness. Here's the question, however, we might want to ask ourselves. Just how different are we from this man? When you think about it, hasn't God given us an amazing bounty of blessings? If we study the scriptures, we learn quickly that we're really considered stewards, caretakers of what God has given us. In a sense, you and I manage God's property. It's not our own, it's God's. We just have possession of it for a while. The mistake some of us, or maybe all of us, to a degree make is believing that all we have is due to our own efforts so that we can do anything we want with it, including keeping it for ourselves. When it comes to giving to God, do we only give what's left over rather than our first fruits? What about the gift of God's creation? How well are we caring for it? I'd say not very well, and that we could be accused of squandering God's property, to borrow language attributed to the manager in today's parable. You know, as a third example, you and I as Christians celebrate that we are beneficiaries of God's grace. It's a gift given to us in abundance, but how well do we take care of it? And by that I mean, how well are we actively sharing love with others, all others? You see it? The twist in this story told by Jesus, and by the way, that's typical of the parables he taught. There was usually a twist or a surprise ending that gets us thinking anew. The twist here, at least one of them, is that you and I are not all that different from the unjust steward. As in the folktale of the thief who was going to plant the pomegranate seed, you and I have not led perfect lives, and we're just as guilty of sin. And included in such sin, perhaps, is how we've squandered God's property given to us to manage. We have not done all we can with what God has given us. Like the manager, we tend to look out for ourselves. Given our failings, given the fact that we've squandered what God has given us and that we've, we're self-centered in our attitude, what has the Lord said about us? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We listen to this parable of Jesus, and we may feel derision toward the unjust steward, when in fact we're all unjust stewards. We're just as undeserving, um, and we're, or we're just as deserving, rather, of being called to account. Every one of us could be dismissed by the one in charge because of how we failed again and again to be the productive people God wants and calls us to be. Just imagine how God could view us as we feel scorn towards someone like the unjust steward in the parable, when in fact, we're not all that different. Well, now you might understand the twist in the story when the rich man does not heap criticism on his manager, but instead speaks well of him. Because in spite of all the ways you and I might fall short in the eyes of God, God in Christ nevertheless speaks well of us while hanging from the cross between two thieves, saying, Father, forgive them. Bishop Will Willimon suggests that we ought to see this parable from this other perspective, that we so-called nice church people need to acknowledge that we're not always such nice people. We're sinners, all of us, in need of God's grace. But the wonderful news is that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, just like the unjust steward, just like you and me. Willimon writes, why would a nice person like Jesus take such unabashed delight in the shenanigans of this little thief? Maybe because Jesus was the sort of savior who was willing to die but hanging between two thieves. It would take a savior like Jesus to see anything lovable, anything redeemable in a crook like this man in the parable. And maybe if that's true, Willimon adds, then we all have reason to give thanks that a savior like Jesus might see something lovable, something redeemable in people like us. For this reason, he suggests that maybe we shouldn't refer to this as the parable of the dishonest manager, but rather as the story of the outrageous savior. J 
Jesus Christ reaches out to us, us, selfish sinners, and rather than condemn us, he lifts us up with words of life and the gift of redemption. And that's what makes Jesus such an outrageous Savior, his willingness to accept us and even welcome us with open arms, even though we are otherwise unacceptable because of our sinfulness. Let me wrap this up by saying this. There are actually a number of other layers to this story that we could dive into, but we don't have the time. But there's one other thought I want to leave before we close as we wrap this up. The rich man commended the manager, not for his dishonesty, not, but for his resourcefulness because he was quick on his feet. He was looking to the future rather than just the past, which is something for us to emulate. You see, we should acknowledge that we're sinners who have made mistakes in the past, but we should not get stuck on those past failures. God doesn't just see us as who we have been. God sees us for who we are and who we can be by the healing and transforming power of God's grace. As one writer puts it, the manager in the parable is not paralyzed with his guilt. Some who come to worship may remind themselves of past sins and, and they hear how they should have lived. That's how they come to church. They want that. Maybe that's you this morning. They use worship as a whip to punish themselves rather than as a key to opening the dungeon doors they've imprisoned themselves behind. Is that your story today? The unjust steward makes no such mistake. He doesn't crawl into a hole and quit, determined to beat himself over the head for his mistakes the rest of his life. He acts quickly. Things may be bad, but he's determined not to let them get any worse. The dishonest manager was commended because he was quick on his feet. Jesus encourages us to be quick on our feet as well, not for personal gain, but in service to him. To be quick enough to receive the gift of his grace. And then by being resourceful with what we have, even borrowing ideas from those of this world, we can serve the Lord faithfully and effectively. Praise be to God.